turn it over to David. Okay, great. Um, well, good morning and, and thanks for coming. Um, some, of, some of you haven't been here for the previous uh, sessions. And, um, I'm, I'll just recap sort of where we came from. And uh, today I think that uh, Dory and I have a theme that we're going to riff on that, um, that is related to this. So, so the, the idea is that we as a, as a world have been living through a truly unique and unusual time in the history of all our experiences. There are very few times when something really comes into the world and forces the entire world to change their behavior and the way they act. And we think about things like world wars where you know there are clashes and people are affected in so many corners of the globe, but the COVID epidemic has been a really unique experience. We can all think back recently. In March of 2020, we were rocking along with a pleasant world that we thought we knew a lot about. And within weeks, we were all confronted with the notion that there was a mode by which young, healthy people were being killed and dying. And we didn't know exactly what it was, where it was coming from, how it was spread, and we had no tools to stop it, save for the fact that we knew it was spreading person to person, and so we realized that to slow it down, we had to practice isolation. We had to suddenly, instead of living as community and close and tight, which we love and we thrive in, we had to choose as a world to be separated, to isolate. And so we've gone through this very educational experience of learning uh, firsthand the value of all the communities we're part of, how our work works, where we get together and we've learned to work separately and by Zoom and much more individually. Schools where we know we learn in communities and, and so on and yet we sent our children home and isolated them. And there was a huge and ongoing cost of that experience. And um, our elders, our hospitals, people in crisis, we all cut them off with huge pain and loss. And so the epidemic really gave us a time to reflect on the true value of community and to readjust our world to how we're going to live in community and, and what the values of isolation, separation, and so on are. They are real and, and they are part of the way we operate as well. But this epidemic we think has given us a chance to really think in depth and, and consider our lived experience over the last few years of the value of the community and the costs and value of isolation. So that was the theme of, of our, our first um, day together. Um, and Dory, what was the theme of our second day? Um, we were that the most essential workers are often not the poorest. Yeah, yeah. We we realized that as we reshuffled our perception of the world, the notion of who among us are essential, who, how are how are we all essential in one way, and and how do we value? people that are essential and, and the values of the lived lives of each other. And this epidemic really put a magnifying glass on the way our society depends for our very existence on many, many people that are not honored, are not held up as uh, being essential and valuable and unique in the way that they deserve to be. And so we've had an opportunity to, 
to, to really readjust our thinking toward the value of people and, and to realize that we're all part of a, an interrelated group that has essential ways we contribute to each other. So today I wanted to just um, think about what viruses have taught me about the reality of successful existence. And the reality, I've been working, as many of you know, uh, to try to, to battle the HIV virus and to, to, to stop its progression through the world. Um, and it turns out that, you know, HIV is, a, is an example of a very successful life form. We've had a very hard time. And in fact, so far, we really have no way to get rid of this virus. And the essence of the, the magic that HIV illustrates is that it is an artist of continual change. So this virus, it's a little strand of RNA. We know every single sequence of it in detail, but the truth of it is that we reproduce it in so many copies and so many forms that it can constantly change its behavior. So if I am infected with HIV virus, my body is just a, a lovely place for it to grow. It says, wow, this is a gold mine. I've got everything perfect. And it finds my cells and starts to grow in them. And this virus grows at a remarkable rate. It has a, a doubling time of just a day or day and a half. It only takes one day to make all new viruses. And it turns out that from day to day, this virus continually is changing. So my immune system says, uh-oh, I've got trouble here, and I've got a very good immune system, it goes to work, makes antibodies, it trains cells to kill this virus and get rid of it. But as soon as my cells get skilled at that, the virus mutates just enough, it changes just a little bit, so that my defense system doesn't quite work so the virus can keep going, so my immune system changes. But the problem with this virus, and the reason we can't cure it, is because it changes faster than our immune system can catch up with it. And so it succeeds by its ability to change. And that, I think, is the essence of successful living as well. You know, it's, we aren't meant to be stable if, if things are, planted, they're, they're dead, they're not alive, they're, they've got to be alive, they've got to change. So the COVID epidemic, we've lived through, this is another example, you know, I got up pontificating about, oh, I know a great deal about viruses, and you know, we're, we're getting a handle on this COVID virus, and by the way, you know, it is a weak sister, nothing virus compared to the virus I work on, you know, this HIV is... It's a slippery customer. It integrates itself into your cell, and you've had it. But, eh, COVID, it's a big virus. It replicates much more slowly. It's going to change very slowly. I don't think we're going to have so much trouble fighting this virus. And, uh, so one of the lessons of the COVID epidemic is humility. Uh, you know, <laughs> so... You know, we're, we're truly not so smart. And, and, you know, it turns out this has been one of the surprises of the COVID epidemic is that this virus does change. And, you know, it turns out it's a pretty successful virus. And, and so we've all gotten to see that. I, we've talked about how this virus lives by being spread in, in the air. Uh, you breathe it in and the, the nifty cells that like it, that have this ACE receptor that the spike of the virus says, aha, this identifies the ideal cell for me to grow in, it's just all through your nose. And so your nose sniffs it in, virus says, pop, I've found my home, 
and it's off and running. And so that's beautiful. We've made immune systems that slow it down just a little bit, but it turns out that the proteins on the spike of the coronavirus uh, change very gradually, and so the original virus that started out in Wuhan, in we found it in December, early January of 2020, by March, we'd identified, aha, oh, there's a new virus, and it turns out that the way the virus succeeds is it finds a little bit tighter way to attack and attach to the nose, and so the new one that's a little bit smarter, a little bit faster, gets ahead of the old one, and pretty soon, amazingly, the whole virus in the world changes, and so within three or four months, the original virus from China had a new mutation, and we started to see it in, in London, and Dubai, and Cape Town, and, and my God, the world is tightly linked, so tightly linked, and this virus illustrates it. And we've seen waves of the epidemic because our immune systems, our vaccines, and so on, get all set. They say, okay, we've got virus X. And then a slightly different, slightly more successful virus comes along, and whoosh, there's a wave of virus that spreads around the world another time. And we've already gone through Delta and Omicron 1 and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, that is the way. So, so my thought about what this epidemic is. We've lived, we've watched how a living presence in the world can, um, can change and succeed and carry on and affect the whole world. And it's my belief this is just another way that we can reflect on the necessity of our continual growth and change as individuals. And humans have a hard time. We've got this, unlike HIV virus that makes new copies every day and a half, you know, we make a new copy about, oh, in my case, every hundred years or something. Um, it, it's hard to change in the DNA sense very fast, although People are changing gradually over time. Uh, it turns out, I don't know, are, do we have any deep scientists here in the room that know about epigenetics? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, so, so uh, there is this way in which things are speeded up in the accessing of the DNA, the information we're all wired with that we get from our parents and we're stuck with basically for our whole lives. Turns out that you can kind of change it with putting methyl groups on in different places. You change the accessibility of that DNA, that genetic information. And people through experience in life evolve and change in ways that even can be passed on in this somewhat differed DNA, that the DNA hasn't changed, but the information on it continues to evolve. So that's, that's the way we are. We as people are changeable, and if we intend to succeed, we have to live with our stability, but also be prepared to change and grow. And I think, to me, this epidemic has just, you know, it's just given this brilliant, beautiful, amazing illustration that reminds us of, of this kind of fundamental part of the way life has to be in work to be successful. So I'm going to turn it over to Dory. I riff too much. I, I can try to answer questions if you, or if people want to comment about that topic. Or, yeah, yeah. Where did they come up with the name COVID? Um, it was Coronavirus Disease 2019, and so it was run together for, for
as COVID was corona virus, the um, disease, and then 2019 was the name of the yeah, respiratory syncytial virus. So it's another of the respiratory viruses that again, you know, it's sort of, it's not quite such a pathogenic thing as flu, but uh, unfortunately it does get in and cause serious lung disease. And it's particularly dangerous to young children and, and to those that are older. And we're, we're more vulnerable, our immune systems are uh, a little bit more uh, uh, liable to, to be violated by it. Yes? Do you think we're ever going to get rid of viruses or they're just no. going to keep changing? No, they're going to keep changing. That's, yeah, no, this is, this is one of the, the, the ways, the, the way that we as, as creatures interact with the other living environment. Uh, we're full of and covered with bacteria and viruses. Our genome even has, if you break down our genome, we've got a whole bunch of other retroviruses, cousins of HIV virus, that are actually part of all of human genetics. So we, we have lived with and incorporated and found ways to, to deal with viruses, but this is, this is the world God created. We're, we're going to live in it. That's, uh, that's the way it is. Yes. Why has there been so little progress on HSP over the years? Ah. Her, uh, herpes simplex viruses. So, so the herpes viruses are, are another very um, prevalent class of viruses. They're DNA viruses. They're in most of us, so so these herpes viruses are DNA viruses that that we um, get infected with, and their one of their magic powers also is that they can live late. They live within certain cells in our body and and stay out of the way most of the time. So herpes viruses, for instance, cause cold sores, and you know probably. 95% or more of us in this room have these herpes viruses and they stay quiet. Um, if you get sick, if you get some immune deficiency, then that virus says, ah, this person's a little weak and it breaks out and you'll get a little infestation of it. Chicken pox is a herpes virus. It's varicella virus and it lives quietly, but it comes back in the form of shingles. And so we have to have a shingles vaccine to build up our immune system so it will keep that virus quiet in its place. But we never get rid of it. It's in our body forever. Um, and that's the characteristic of this whole, the, the herpes viruses are all uh, of that class. Uh, there's a, you know, a, great, a, a very serious life-threatening encephalitis that I teach my medical students to, you know, to immediately diagnose because if you can diagnose it in the first day, then you can save a person's life, and it will kill most people if you let it go. And we now have antiviral drugs. It's a relatively rare thing, but you know, we, we have learned some ways to deal with herpes viruses. They're well adapted to living with us. Okay, Dory's got a great message. I think we ought to let her talk. things that we have learned as humans, not only are viruses changing all the time, but nothing is stable. Everything is, is constantly energy in, in reshaping and shaping. So what we experience as a solid world, in fact, is just motion of atoms and, and so on. And so this sense that everything is in change and everything is in in motion and energy, um, and that solidity um, is actually an illusion, um, made me think that we should think about 
and the theologists have started thinking more and more about how our theology needs to change as well, and our understanding of God needs to change as well. When I went to seminary, my pastor said, your, um, your task as a seminarian is to understand evil and suffering. You need to come away with a theology of evil and suffering. So I want to look a little bit at those two, at that concept of how we traditionally have looked on evil and suffering and how theologists are now talking about God in relation to evil and suffering. So the traditional, there are a couple of ways of looking at evil and suffering. The there are two main traditional ways of looking at it. One is disaster and disease are punishment for human sin. And we find this throughout the Old Testament particularly. Um, <clears throat> But the problem with that is, is that poor people then must be sinners. Uh, diseased people must be punished, must be, God is punishing them for their sin if they have a disease. Um, and the opposite is that if you're rich, then you must be righteous, of course. And if you are prospering, then you must be blessed by God. So those are huge moral issues uh, that says that if you're poor, you're a sinner. Um, and the whole book of Job is all about that. Um, Job said, Job has all these things, terrible things happen to him, and he keeps saying, no, I did not sin. I did not do something against God. And, and he basically says, that God gives and God takes away, but it has nothing to do with, per with human sin. So, and when Jesus comes along, you remember this question in John, where Jesus asked, is asked, well, who sinned, his parents or himself, that this man was born blind? And Jesus says, neither one of them sinned but rather he was born blind so that we may see the work of God in his life. And that kind of leads into the second, whoops, the second way that we tend to look at suffering and, um, and disaster, and that is but God has some kind of a greater plan that we just don't understand. That when terrible things happen to us, when we get sick, when our friends get sick, when there's COVID that spreads around the world, well, God has a greater plan. And you may have heard this, everything happens for a reason. Actually, that's Aristotle. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> Uh, the closest thing that they, that's in the Bible is all things work together for those who love the Lord, uh, which is Romans, um, who, and Paul, Paul is pretty well influenced by some of the Greek philosophers, so um, it's, it's not in Jesus' teaching that everything happens for a reason. But both of, and, and I think that a lot of people who, who lean on that, everything happens for a reason, that God is in control, that we just don't understand, that really undercuts people's ability to experience hardship, to experience pain, and it undercuts real and true grief. That somehow we should not be grieving because God has a bigger plan. And you just don't understand it. And that's real. I've, I've talked to so many people in the hospital who just held on to this idea that everything happens for a reason. So 
I must be, there must be some greater lesson for me here, the fact that I have cancer that's pervading the body. It's just really, really hurtful in lots of ways. And both of these traditional views lean on what I call the omnis, which again are Greek ideas. They're not really biblical. Um, the idea that God is omnipotent, that God is all powerful, omnipotent. Okay. Uh, I'm really having trouble with my stuff today. Sorry. My sticky stuff is not sticking. You're right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> God is God is controls everything. Okay. The second one, God is omniscient. That God knows everything, every frame from the past to the present. That God sent it all in, into action, and it's all planned out, and it's just playing out. That God is immovable, immovable, and unchanging. That seems totally opposite of what the universe is, that God is, that God would be opposite of the universe that God created, that God is eternal and perfect. Uh, these are all things that these traditional ways of looking at um, suffering um, are about. And then the Holocaust came. The Holocaust killed six million Jews, but it also killed four million non-Jews. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, gypsies, homosexuals, people who were uh, disabled, uh, either mentally or physically, um, people who stood against the Nazis. Um, oh, oh and, and Poles and other slaughtered people. All these people were taken to concentration camps and killed along with the Jews. Um, oh, and people who had mixed children, um, either racially mixed or, or religiously mixed. There was a time when evil seemed to overwhelm. But it was also a time during World War II um, you find all different uh, estimates. Anywhere the low end is about 35 million people were killed, all the way up to 85 million people were killed in World War II. The largest number of deaths were among the Chinese and the Russians, and we tend to forget that. Uh, the Germans, about 4 million Germans were killed, so you can see that the balance of non-Germans who died during World War II is pretty huge. And there's just too much death. Too much death to explain things in a traditional manner um, of using these other traditional ways of explaining how God is involved with suffering and pain. So, see if I can do this without. So theologians began to say there's too much death. And if God, if this, all of this death is a result of God's plan, then God is evil. And in fact, if God simply allowed it all to happen, then God is still evil. And how do, you, how do you manage to say that God allowed everything that happened, all the death in World War II, and still say that God is loving and merciful? How can World War II be the work of a loving and merciful God? Uh, we could say the same about COVID. How could COVID, which took over the world and changed the world, be the work of a loving and merciful God. 
So I'm going to introduce you to a new way of thinking. This is called process theology. I'm a process theologian myself. Um, some of it I don't understand, and it's really hard to read in the original thinkers of it. Um, I think that's true of most theology. If you try to read the, the original theologists, theologians, you're like, what? <laughs> you have to read what other people said, the original theologians said, in order to understand it. But they basically said that God is part of the eternal process of change and creation. That God is, like everything else, moving and acting. And that God and the universe are mutually dependent on one another. And then they said that the world is created in ultimate freedom, freedom that God does not violate down to, my past used to say down to the cellular level. I would now say down to the viral level, down to the atomic level, etc. It seems that when you look at the way electrons move, that the only way you can explain why one electron goes this way and another goes this way is by choice, which seems strange that electrons have choice. But in this idea of the world created an ultimate freedom, it means that cancer exists. It means that cars go off the road. It means that coronavirus spreads around the world. So, so what is, so where is God in this ultimate freedom? Well, God's main power then is, is persuasive, not coercive or controlling. God is not in control of everything. God rather is trying to always pull us to the good. Um, rather than, so God is trying to persuade rather than coerce and control. And God experience, this for me is the biggest thing. God experiences all that we experience. So God is totally present and experiences everything that we experience. So God experiences our grief, our sorrow, our joy, our love, all the emotions that we experience, all the things that we experience are experienced by God. And God does not know the future. Rather, God is co-creating with people. People in, in, in large and people individually. God and I are co-creating my life together. Um, and, and God is eternal, not materially or in some kind of magical Form, but rather God is eternal in God's character and God's nature. So God is eternally loving. God is eternally good. God is eternally wise. Um, and God does not force God's will on either people or the universe. And finally, as I said, God is omnipresent in the present. Um, that everything that we know and experience is being experienced by God. And that therefore, God also preserves all of the past in God's self. So, there's a story about the during the Holocaust, that in the concentration camp, there were a bunch of, there were several people who were about to be hung, and one of them was a small child, small boy, young boy, and when they pulled the, the thing to make everybody fall down, he didn't weigh enough to break his neck. And so he's hanging up there and struggling and flailing around with his neck unable 
feed or live or die. And somebody said, where is God in all of this? Meaning, how did God allow this to happen? And the rabbi said, God is right there with that boy experiencing all that he experiences. So that is, that is what I came to believe about suffering and evil and how God works into that whole process.